Hello, everyone. So we are getting ready to start. Even though we still have some people here to join us, but we can start so that they join us along the way. Um, before we start, since this is um, a conference with people from various places across the world, if you don't mind, let's break the ice. So I would like to see where our audience are coming from. Yes, introduce yourself in the chat box, your name and where you are currently. That would be great. Please, let's break the ice. Just type your name and where you are coming from or where you are currently, where you are staying, place of residence at the moment. All right, so we have Philip from Kenya. Okay, all right. So we have Pat from Texas, we know. Someone from India. Cynthia, California, Dr. Neha, India. All right, so we have Sunni from California as well. All right, that's great. So once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining from. I am the host, main host for today's event, and my co-host is Samuel, Samuel Mawuto, and I'm currently based in Ghana, and my colleague, even though he's from Ghana, he's in India currently. So together with him, we will be hosting today's event, the Forensic Post Online Lecture Series, Episode 8. We'll be looking at latent fingerprint development and comparison by which is going to be handled by Mr. Pat with him. So without much further ado, I would like my co-host, Mr. Samuel Mauto, to come in and give us an introduction of the speaker before we start. Sam, if you are there, please kindly take over. Yeah. Hello. Please, am I audible? Yes, please, you are audible. Hello. Oh, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, you are joining from. I welcome you all to another episode of Forensic Post Online Lecture Series with Mr. Pat A. Wetham, a latent print examiner and consultant, Texas, USA, on the topic latent fingerprint development and comparison. We will give a, a very brief introduction about um, our guest speaker. Mr. Wetham boasts a distinguished 50 year career in law enforcement with a significant portion dedicated to the examination of latent fingerprints. Alongside his primary role as a latent fingerprint, he's an independent consultant specializing in crime scene and fingerprint related matters. His extensive formal education spanning the years 1966 to 1988 includes studies at Texas A&M University in Geophysics, China College in Law Enforcement, University of Virginia in Fingerprint and Photography, and Collin County CC in Arts. Throughout his illustrious career, Mr. Westham held various key positions in professional law enforcement and related fields. His titles include Latent, finger, latent Print Examiner, CI Fingerprint Tech, Physical Science Trainer, Criminalist, LPE Director of Training, Vice President, Identification Supervisor, Patrolman, Sergeant, Identification Officer, Detective, among others. He accumulated an impressive portfolio of more than 100 law enforcement training certifications, covering a wide array of topics such as homicide investigation, 
in tactical police driving. <coughs> Mr. Waltham, sorry, Mr. Waltham expertise extends beyond the routine tasks of a latent print examiner. He has presented over a hundred papers to professional organizations covering critical subjects like um, latent print fabrication, detection of forged and fabricated latents, and latent print powder techniques. His dedication to professional development is evident in his numerous certifications, including Certified Latent Print Examiner, Certified Term Print Examiner, and Certified Senior Crime Scene Analyst by the International Association of Identification, IAI. His dozens of published will cover a broad spectrum of topics, including explaining fingerprints to the lay, lay person, detection of forged and fabricated latents, and crime scene note taking, showcasing his in depth knowledge and then commitment to advancing forensic science. In addition to his certification and published papers, Mr. Westham holds instructor certification from the Texas, Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Officer Standards and Education. He possesses basic, intermediate, and advanced law enforcement officer qualification acquired from the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Officer Standards and then Education during the years 1973 to 1989. His, commit his commitment to maintaining high standard in law enforcement is reflected in his voluntary retesting certification in 1996, 1999, 2002, and 2005. Mr. Wells Hunt's contribution to the field had been recognized throughout various awards, including the Best Paper Award at the Fall Meeting 1989 of the Southwestern Association of Forensic Scientists. In 2002, he received the Director's Award for Law Enforcement from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. And then in 2007, the Arizona Department of Public Safety Crime Laboratory honored him with the Special Recognition Award while some of his certification have expired, Mr. Wertham's impact on the field of law enforcement and then later fingerprint examination endures as a testament to his dedication and then expertise. Again, in addition to his professional achievements, Mr. Wertham has been actively involved in various professional associations, including distinguished memberships, seven and seven on committees and then even assuming leadership positions. His impactful testimony in high profile cases globally further cements his legacy as a leading authority in latent fingerprint examination and law enforcement. The audience, Mr. Pat A. Wetham. Mr. Pat A. Wetham, your audience, we look forward to having an insightful and an educative presentation from you today. Welcome you all again, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. And Munta, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I want to let you know in advance, I'm, uh, uh, I have been suffering this week from a case of flu, <clears throat> and my voice is not quite normal, so I'm hoping it will last for our session. If I resort to whispering, it will be because my voice has failed totally. But uh, we will go ahead and and uh, launch into this presentation. Uh, was uh, okay. So um, I have prepared a PowerPoint. When Munta contacted me and asked me to do this, uh, I understood that it was to be a a basic introduction to fingerprint development and comparison. Obviously, in the time allotted, I cannot do a comprehensive course on fingerprint development or fingerprint comparison. Uh, but what I want to do is, is, especially for those who are new to the field, give you some idea of what is entailed in a fingerprinting expert's job and hopefully even to some of the more experienced crime scene technicians and fingerprint examiners, I hope to be able to give you maybe a few 
hints or clues that you haven't thought of during your career. Now, with that, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, share my screen with you. Ah, and this says I am not allowed to share my screen. So let's come over here and come here, share. Okay, there we go. And now let's come to here. Okay. So once again, my name is Pat Wertheim. I live in Texas in the USA. You have my email address there, and I will show this slide again at the end of the presentation. And I always welcome email communications from anybody that uh, has a question that I might be able to answer. So please feel free to, to email me later on with more questions that you might have. Uh, in, in latent fingerprint development and comparison, there are two types of examinations or two types of reports and two types of testimony. The first is the fact witness. And this is the person who processes the crime scene, processes the element, uh, evidence, develops the fingerprints and captures them, but does not do the comparison. The other kind of witness and the other kind of fingerprint expert is what we refer to as the expert witness. And that is the person who compares the finger marks uh, with the known prints of different people and forms a conclusion as to the source of the finger mark. So I want to cover both of these. Uh, the the non-expert, uh, who is the crime scene investigator, the crime scene officer, the laboratory technician who develops prints, who photographs them. Uh, and then secondly, in part two, I will talk about the comparison of fingerprints and identifications and the expert who testifies to them. In fingerprints, there are two basic types. The first we will call a mark. And a finger mark is from an unknown source. Uh, in the United States, we call that a latent print. In most of the world, it's called a finger mark. It's usually invisible to the naked eye or to the unaided eye. And the technician's job is to make the fingerprint visible so that it can be preserved and later compared. When I talk about a print, I'm talking about a fingerprint taken from a known person, usually with ink or with a live scan device. And the expert then compares the marks and the prints to determine if they came from the same uh, individual. There is no validated method to determine the age of a finger mark, except that in general terms, when questioned uh, in court, I will testify that it was probably left after the last thorough cleaning of the surface on which it was found. Now, there is a reason that we can't determine the age of a finger mark, and that is we don't know the composition of it at the time it was deposited. It could have been simply sweat and moisture from the palm of the person's hand. It could have contained sebaceous materials or body oils if the person had rubbed his hand across his face or through his hair. It could contain other more um, substantial elements such as uh, motor oil, for example, from a car mechanic or shortening or lard from a person who has been working in the kitchen. So because we don't know the exact composition of the fingerprint residue or the mark at the time it was deposited, we have no way of being able to determine the age of that mark. And the other thing that's important to remember is that the presence of a fingerprint or a finger mark on a surface only proves that the person to whom it can be identified, touched that, that surface at some time in the past. 
Uh, it is not up to us as fingerprint experts to infer guilt on the part of a person whose fingerprint we identify. We can only determine the identification, the source of the fingerprint, and it is the responsibility of the the jury or the judge or the court to determine innocence or guilt when it comes to a specific crime. In general, when we're examining surfaces for fingerprints, the sooner we can conduct an examination um, after the crime has been reported or after the mark was deposited, the more likely we are to develop that print and be able to preserve it. The longer the time interval between the deposition of a print and our attempts to make it visible, the more likely it is to deteriorate. Now, having said that, I'll go back and repeat what I said earlier, that we don't know the exact composition of a finger mark when it's deposited. And therefore, fingerprints may last only minutes or days in some circumstances, or they may last for millennia in other circumstances. Um, in one trip uh, in the American West, um, I found an ancient Indian dwelling, probably close to a thousand years old, a small shelter back in a cave where some uh, American Indian or American native a thousand years in the past had used mud to plaster some rocks together. And on examining that mud, I observed these thousand year old fingerprints of the person who had constructed that little shelter. Uh, I stood in awe and very carefully put the, the piece of mud back down and left it in that shelter cave where I found it. But we can't uh, determine the age of a fingerprint. We can, however, say that the sooner evidence is examined for fingerprints, the better our chances of developing a fingerprint on that surface. We can also say that the less handling an item is subjected to prior to processing, the better our chances of finding a fingerprint. Uh, a lot of emphasis today is put on handling items with gloves. I would suggest to you that that does little to preserve the finger marks that are on an item. Gloves only serve to prevent you from leaving your fingerprints on the item. But if your glove touches on top of another fingerprint, it can easily remove the fingerprints on the item you're handling. Most important when you're handling an item is to assess the item initially for the location where the finger marks are most likely to be uh, developed, and then don't handle it in that area. Um, as I taught in classes for many, many years, when you're handling an item of evidence, handle it in a manner inconsistent with normal handling. <laughs> Hello, uh, am I the only one who lost audio or oh, it's everyone? But kindly check your audio. Yes, please. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Uh, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. Okay, you can. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, excuse me. I hit the, the cough button there for a second. You can hear me all right now? Yeah, great. Hello? Hello? Munta, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, please. We can hear you. I think the sound is off again. 
Yes, the sound is off again. Am I on again now? Yes. All right. Um, my apologies for that. Um, talking about gloves, I was saying that gloves do not preserve fingerprints on an item that you're handling. depositing our own fingerprints and gloves prevent us from depositing our own DNA on an item that might be later examined for DNA. Therefore, at crime scenes and when handling evidence, we wear gloves, but we have to be careful not to handle an item uh, the, the best rule is to think about normal handling, how the criminal might have handled a specific item or how the criminal might have proceeded to the crime scene. And then don't touch the surfaces that are most likely to have fingerprints, but handle items in a manner inconsistent with normal handling. And if a part of a surface is incompatible with the preservation of marks, handle it there. The classic example is a handgun that has checkered grips where you will never develop fingerprints on the grips of the handgun. Therefore, if you handle the gun by the grips, you, you uh, do not run any danger of destroying fingerprints that might be on other parts of the weapon. As often as possible, when I was at crime scenes, I would process most of my evidence at the scene of the crime. However, there are some items which we take back to the laboratory now because of the wide variety of development techniques that are available to us there. Um, and any items that are going to be seized and kept as evidence should be processed in the laboratory where you have more control over it. But where you have a large number of items at the crime scene, it may be preferable to process them there and seize only those items on which marks are identifiable uh, and keep those items as evidence. At a crime scene, normally we will use the fingerprint powders, and there are two types of powders. And we had very few techniques for developing fingerprints on evidence at that time. Typically, um, we use powder on non-porous surfaces, and we used a chemical called ninhydrin on porous surfaces. Uh, those were the only two techniques that I reviews now. Powder. There are magnetic powders and non-magnetic powders. We use the uh, uh, magnetic fingerprint powder on non-magnetic items, aluminum cans, glass bottles, window panes, for example, countertops or uh, door frames that are painted. The magnetic fingerprint powder works very well on non-magnetic items, but not so well on items that that themselves are magnetic. For example, uh, a steel gun or a steel knife may not be the best surface to process with magnetic powder because the powder itself will cling to the, to the iron surface. The other type of powder is the non-magnetic uh, black fingerprint powder. And that's easier to use on large surfaces, for example, a, a car body or a, a large countertop or the counter in a bank, because it's much faster than the magnetic powder. Um, and we use a soft fiberglass brush, usually. Originally, hair, and they were called camel's hair brushes. And don't ask me why the <laughs> why the uh, 
the brush was made of squirrel's hair and called camel's hair. But those were the original brushes. When fiberglass came along, uh, fingerprint brushes were more often made of softer fiberglass, which is much better for applying the fingerprint powder. Now, occasionally you will find a greasy uh, finger mark that will overdevelop with black powder very easily. And this is especially true on a car body. And if you're fingerprinting the body of a vehicle, a car or a truck, and you're using the black powder and a fingerprint develops into a large blob, you can sometimes clean that up and actually make it into a usable finger mark with the careful application of magnetic powder, which will remove the excess black powder. I would urge you to experiment with this method using your own fingerprints before you actually try it on evidence. But an overdeveloped fingerprint on a core body can be cleaned up sometimes using magnetic powder. Never use the powder straight out of the jar. There are several reasons for this, and I will demonstrate, or, or I've got some photographs that I took showing how I prefer to use powder. I use powder out of a shallow dish, and an ideal disposable dish can be made from an inked fingerprint card. In the United States, we use cards that are 8 inches by 8 inches, and they're on a very heavy, um, very heavy paper stock. When you dip your fiberglass brush into the fingerprint jar, you're actually mashing the powder or compressing it into small balls or clumps that will leave streaks like, finger, like pencil marks on a surface that you're fingerprinting. Whereas if you're working out of a shallow dish, your brush can actually be used to grind the powder up finer so that you're using a better powder for fingerprinting. And then the dish can be held under the surface you're fingerprinting to catch excess powder to prevent that from making a mess at a crime scene. Um, so we never use our fingerprint powder straight out of the jar. We never dip our brush into the jar. And a second reason for that is that if there is contamination on a surface, that is to say contamination with DNA, then that DNA, trace amounts of it, can be transferred back into the fingerprint powder. And subsequent crime scenes can be contaminated with DNA from previous crime scenes where that DNA is carried by the fingerprint powder. So I recommend that you never use fingerprint powder directly from the jar. Rather, what I suggest is you take a fingerprint card, cut it halfway through, Cut it from anywhere on the card to the middle of the card, and then overlap the cut edges just slightly and run a strip of tape to, uh, to connect the two sides. This creates a very shallow dish then. When you dump the fingerprint powder out of the jar into the dish, you'll see those little balls that I was talking about, little balls and little clumps of fingerprint powder. If those little balls are clumps, get stuck in the fingerprint brush, then you leave streaks that look like pencil marks across the surface that you're trying to fingerprint. So when we dump the fingerprint powder into this shallow dish that we've made, we can use the fingerprint brush to grind that powder up much, much finer. A second advantage of constructing this little dish, especially out of a, a square fingerprint card like this is that you can place the edge of that dish against a surface and then powder the surface and capture the dust that is falling off of the fingerprint brush so that it doesn't fall to the floor or fall into the to the carpet many times um, when i was a supervisor new fingerprint officers would do more damage to a house with fingerprint powder than the burglar had done by breaking the window and entering the house. Uh, I have seen whole rooms of carpet destroyed by spilled fingerprint powder. I've seen furniture uh, destroyed by fingerprint powder in the upholstery. And so I always instruct 
instructed my crime scene technicians when I was training them to construct a small dish like this, put perhaps only a, a, a teaspoon or a, a half a cc of fingerprint powder into that little dish, grind it up, and then use it with the dish to capture the excess powder. And then you can add a little bit more powder as necessary while you're processing the fingerprint. Once a mark has been developed with powder, it should be photographed in place before it is lifted. Uh, when I got into this business, that was not, not always possible because of the cost of film, the cost of the chemical developing, the cost of printing the photographs. But with digital photography, it is always possible to photograph your fingerprints before you lift them. When they're photographed, you should have a scale in there to to show this the the, uh, the size of the print. You should also have some kind of marking to show which direction is up. One of the big hazards of lifting prints is that wrinkles can occur in the tape. Uh, therefore, you have to be very careful to avoid wrinkles. And once you lift a print, you should immediately write down all of the case information on the card. Date, time, the address of the scene, the offense, case number, etc. Now, in a large crime scene, you may not want to take the time to fill out every card completely before you move on to the next print. But you should at least put down the surface from which that print was lifted and the time that you took the lift. And then you can fill in the rest of that information later. I mentioned that wrinkles are one of the big problems with tape when you're lifting a fingerprint. On a flat surface, you start with the tape off to the side of the mark and smooth it then gently across the mark where you can avoid wrinkles. That's not a good method on a curved surface. For example, a vase or a light bulb or a round doorknob where you have a mark like that. Um, if you start off to the side of the mark, you will actually increase the danger of wrinkles developing in the middle of the finger mark. So on a curved surface, you're better off starting the tape in the very center of the mark, but you have to be careful when you do that, that the tape does not touch the surface and then lift and then touch it again a second time. So you want to get it down firmly in the center of the print and then smooth it outward away from that. And as soon as you put the lift on the card, draw a picture uh, or some indication of where the mark was on the surface and indicate directionality. Usually you'd indicate the direction up with an arrow next to the finger mark that you have placed on the card next to the piece of tape. This is a typical lift card that is available commercially. Uh, this comes from the company called Evident. Uh, their website is shopevident.com. And they sell a number of fingerprint supplies. Uh, it has boxes for all of the information on it. It has a small scale that you can place next to the mark when you photograph it. And then it has an area to draw the sketch or the diagram. The, the tape itself would be placed on the reverse side of this card. The first police department I worked for in 1973 was very cost conscious. And they did not want to spend the extra money that these cards cost. We bought the three by five inch index cards from the local office supply, and we would buy them by the hundreds. They're much, much cheaper than lift cards, and they work just as well. They simply do not have the, the printed boxes for the information. Also, fingerprint lift tape is expensive. And for the first, oh, probably six or eight years of my career, I never used commercially available lift tape. We used two-inch wide clear packaging tape, which we also bought from the office supply. Uh, the large rolls like you would buy to, uh, to wrap packages for mailing the clear tape. So we would use plain index cards and commercially available packaging tape as a much less expensive alternative to the commercially available lift cards and lift tape. The chemical that we use to develop fingerprints on paper 
is called ninhydrin. You can buy it in a powder form or you can buy it pre-mixed. My favorite solution of ninhydrin was an old solution that utilized Freon as the carrier for the fingerprints. And I've never found a solution that worked as well as Freon. However, when Freon was outlawed because of environmental concerns, a number of alternatives have come up which are suitable. Uh, the simplest and easiest solution is simply to use acetone as a carrier. And you would use a, a jar that's one ounce or 26 grams of ninhydrin powder per gallon of acetone or per four liters of acetone. And that provides a very usable solution of ninhydrin. The drawback to that solution is that it dissolves ink. And therefore, if you're processing a piece of paper on which the writing is important, the solution may actually dissolve and erase the writing. So, for example, a forged check or a robbery note, uh, you might lose the writing. If you're going to use a solution like that, you would want to, to uh, photograph and copy the document completely before you process it for fingerprints. If you have the chemical availability, there are much more sophisticated solutions of ninhydrin that do not dissolve the ink. You can also buy this chemical in premixed solutions and in spray cans, where all you have to do is spray from the can directly onto the paper and then develop the fingerprint. Now, fingerprints or finger marks turn purple when they're developed with ninhydrin, but they can fade with time. Therefore, if you develop fingerprint marks in that way, you need to photograph them as soon as possible after developing them. Finger marks can be enhanced on paper by the use of heat and moisture. And in most laboratories that do fingerprint processing, you'll find a steam iron. You do not want to iron the paper. You do not want to touch the paper with the steam iron. But the steam iron held an inch or so above the paper is a very adequate way of providing the heat and the moisture to accelerate the development of the finger marks within hydrant. There are cabinets available on the market today, which uh, you would hang your paper in and then close the cabinet up and the cabinet itself generates the heat and the humidity to accelerate the finger marks. So if you work in a laboratory that has these cabinets, those are preferable to the steam iron. But the steam iron is a suitable alternative uh, for, for accelerating the development of in hydrin fingerprints on paper. The fingerprint, as I said, will turn purple. And this is a typical finger mark uh, developed on paper using ninhydrin. Another method of developing finger marks, which is um, an outstanding method, is the superglue fuming method. Superglue is a cyanoacrylate ester, the chemical compound. And the cyanoacrylate polymerizes the organic molecules in the moisture in the finger mark. Uh, what that does is it hardens the finger mark and it turns it white. And then it can be photographed as a white mark or it can be stained with any variety of dyes. Usually the dye stains used on cyanoacrylate or superglue developed fingerprints are fluorescent stains. And to enable uh, viewing and photography of those developed marks then, you need either a laser or a forensic light source and you need to be competent in photographing finger marks using lasers or forensic light sorts. However, the superglue fuming method is, is an excellent method for hardening the print, turning it white, and making it visible. And then it can be photographed as a white print, or it can also be powdered and lifted. And the advantage of doing it 
with the super glue first is that you have hardened the fingerprint before you have powdered and it lifted it so that you lift the powder, but then the super glue mark, the white mark, remains on the surface where you developed it. The most common fingerprint super glue fuming chamber when I got into this business was a simple five gallon fish aquarium like you uh, would purchase at just about any store to keep goldfish in. A five gallon aquarium with a cover on it makes an excellent uh, chamber in which to hang items that you want to to super glue. And you can see several little clips in the picture on your screen, several little clips uh, on the lid of the item. You would put the super glue in one of those little aluminum dishes in the, in the chamber. You might put in a dish, a little dish of hot tap water to give it a little humidity. And then you would hang your items in there and watch the fingerprints develop. When I did this, I would always put one test print on an item and watch my test print develop to make sure the fingerprints uh, that the super glue was working and in a situation like this frequently people would put a fingerprint on the inside of the glass and watch it develop and then if that fingerprint develops and nothing develops on the evidence you can assume that there were no fingerprints on the evidence in the first place there are larger fingerprint chambers available However, they're very expensive. Uh, the laboratory I worked at in Arizona had one the si uh, like the one on the left in this photograph. We could take the shelves out of that, hang a bicycle in it. We could strip the entire interior of a vehicle, the door panels, the dashboard, the steering column, and put all of the interior components of a vehicle into that chamber and fume them. If I was working small cases, I might put as many as 20 cases into that fuming chamber and fume them all at the same time. Uh, that that uh, chamber on the left was an excellent. There are smaller chambers, and you can make a, a super glue chamber out of just about anything. Uh, I was teaching a class in Trinidad and Tobago in the early 90s before super glue chambers were available commercially. And we obtained a large cardboard box from a furniture store and turned that into our super glue fuming chamber. Frequently, even in the crime laboratory, I would use a large metal coffee can as a fuming chamber. I've had cases where I would lay a plastic garbage bag, a large uh, garbage bag or rubbish bag out on a countertop and carefully load my evidence into it, put a pan of super glue into the to the bag and then blow the bag up with my own breath, which would provide the heat and humidity uh, to enable the super glue development to proceed. In one case, we had uh, oh, several hundred kilos of cocaine to fingerprint, and we constructed a plastic frame out of PVC pipe and hung plastic drop cloths over this large frame. Uh, weighted them against the floor, and then evaporated the super glue into that uh, large tent that was made out of those drop cloths. All you need is a sealed chamber, a heat source for the glue, and you need humidity and some type of airflow so that the super glue fumes circulate inside of the chamber. When you super glue a surface, the fingerprint turns white, as I said, and this is a classic a fingerprint on a piece of black plastic developed with super glue. That fingerprint now is, is fixed, has become hard. It won't rub off easily. You can powder it and lift it, and the fingerprint will still be on the surface even after you have lifted it. Uh, these are a couple of other fingerprints on a black surface showing a classic super glue development. <clears throat> this is a fingerprint that has been developed with super glue and then stained with uh, basic yellow 40, which is a common dye stain. Uh, it's a fluorescent stain. And this fingerprint was photographed using fluorescence. Now, obviously, um, if I'm working with a finger mark like this, uh, I will use Adobe Photoshop to invert 
the image and then use the black and white filter to turn it into a black fingerprint on a white background. I use a lot of Adobe Photoshop when I'm working with dye stained fingerprints to correct the color and tone of them. There are dozens of other chemical techniques, more advanced techniques for developing fingerprints. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this introductory presentation to go into any of those. A good fingerprint training program can run up to five years where you learn all of the sophisticated chemical techniques and you learn all of the comparison techniques. You learn how to, how to use the lasers, take laser photography, and also become proficient in the imaging software such as Adobe Photoshop so that you can process um, the images and then use the uh, pro the software to prepare court uh, charts and court exhibits as well. A technician writing a report on developing a fingerprint should include these items in the report. And looking at the clock, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation will be available to you either through uh, the host today or you could email direct me directly and I would be glad to provide uh, this presentation to, to you. The elements of courtroom testimony for crime scene investigators, to, number one, state your qualification, then go into the methods of processing, then and discuss in number two, you would discuss the methods of processing in general. And in number three, you would discuss the items you examined and the specific methods you used. And then the fourth area of your testimony would be the results. And that's where you would introduce into evidence the fingerprint photographs and fingerprint lifts. Now, part two of today's presentation is the comparison of crime scene marks with the known fingerprints. Much of my teaching, much of my, my career and much of my teaching uh, is based on the work of David Ashbaugh with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in his paper, Ridgeology, which was published in the early 1990s in the Journal of Forensic Identification. Uh, David Ashbaugh subsequently wrote a book called Qualitative Quantitative Analysis, um, however, I preferred his earlier paper, and I would be glad to send you a copy of that paper via email um, if you're interested in that. It's perhaps the most succinct and understandable explanation of fingerprint identification that I've ever read, and I use that paper extensively in my teaching. There are three phases that we go through when we're, when we're analyzing or examining finger marks to determine their source or to identify a person. First is the analysis, second is the comparison, and third is the evaluation. Let me talk about those steps. Analysis focuses exclusively on the mark without reference to the known fingerprints, the ink fingerprints, the live scans, whatever you have. Uh, you begin by analyzing the unknown fingerprint, the latent fingerprint, the finger mark, the lift or the photograph that you have. And you analyze the mark for the distortion that might be present for the pattern of the ridges uh, to try to determine the source area of the skin. Is it a finger? Is it a palm? Uh, footprints even, bare footprints occasionally are developed. You want to determine the orientation. And finally, during the analysis of the mark, you want to pick a target. Now, a target is usually a cluster of points, ridge endings, bifurcations, and dots. A target may be some other feature, like a scar or a, a prominent crease in a palm print, for example, might be a target that you would search for. The target is what you will memorize in the unknown fingerprint and then search for in the known fingerprints. Once you find the target, then you can proceed with the comparison.
The target should be at or near a focal point. The focal points, of course, are the deltas and the cores that are present in finger marks or in palm prints. If you are using a cluster of points, three or four points, two techniques that I always used and I taught my students to use is first you draw, you draw the target group. Drawing the three or four points in a small picture helps you to memorize that target group. And finally, if you can give a name to a target group, uh, for example, a little enclosure inside the, the delta, I might call that a banana. And when I'm searching the ink prints, I don't repeat the word enclosure. I repeat the word banana, looking for the banana, searching for the banana, hunt, trying to find the banana. Because if you can give the target a name like that, it will help you to recognize it again when you see it. Uh, two overlapping ridge endings might be a handshake. Uh, I'm looking for the handshake, looking for the handshake, where two little ridge endings overlap each other. Naming the target helps you recognize it. Drawing it helps you memorize it. Naming the target helps you memorize it. After you've done a thorough analysis of the unknown print, you've drawn the target, you've given it a name, you've memorized the target that you're going to be searching for. Then you begin the comparison. And you begin the comparison by focusing on the known fingerprints of your person with minimal reference back to the mark itself. If you have memorized the target correctly, you will recognize it again when you see it. You don't have to constantly go back and forth at this point. The more time you spend in the analysis of the fingerprint, the less time you will spend in the comparison of the fingerprint because the target will be more easily recognizable to you. Once you find the target, then you proceed to put them down side by side and go back and forth um, between them. Now, I would say too that uh, the pattern may not always appear the same in the market as it is in the print. Normally, if you've got a whirl pattern, um, in a mark, you're going to have a whirl pattern in the print. If you've got a loop pattern in a mark, you're going to be looking for a loop pattern in a print, etc. cetera. Uh, there are recorded cases of prints which are drastically different in appearance between the mark and the print itself. So you don't want to uh, put on blinders. You don't want to confine yourself there. Once you find your target, then you put the prints down side by side and you go back and forth. If you can't find your, your first target, go back and find a second target in the mark. Search for the second target. And then you, like I say, then you put them side by side and go back and forth until you find sufficient similarities to declare them identified as having come from the same source, or you find differences that force you to reach a conclusion that they had to have come from different people. Um, find additional points. The evaluation, there are three possible conclusions you can reach. The first is identification. That is, there's sufficient correspondence to determine that they came from the same source. Then there's exclusion. In other words, there are sufficient differences between the two prints to determine that they could not have come from the same finger. And finally, inconclusive, which means you don't have enough information to either identify or exclude a print. Now, these are the three uh, conclusions that I've testified to throughout my career. We are currently going through a paradigm shift in fingerprints. That is to say, the science is changing the way these conclusions are stated. And in the future, we're going to find ourselves testifying to strong support for same source identification, moderate support for same source identification, no no uh, correspondence to, to conclude identification or exclusion, moderate uh, moderate evidence for exclusion and strong evidence for exclusion. We're going to be shifting to um, a different number of conclusions and it's going to be strong support, moderate support, or no support. So watch for this change. You will see it during your career. It's coming. 
And I probably won't be testifying to that um, during what's left of my career. We compare fingerprints on three levels, the pattern, the points, and the shapes within the ridges. And when I'm testifying to fingerprints, I will draw a chart like this in court. I will talk about the patterns, the whirls, the loops, the arch the points, the splitting ridges, and the, the ridge endings. And in the point part of the chart, I will circle a bifurcation, and then I will draw an enlarged bifurcation that shows sweat pores and bumps on the ridges. I have used this chart. I have drawn this chart in court hundreds of times during my career, and I find this to be an especially effective tool in my testimony. Occasionally, I will use a charted enlargement such as the one I've got up here now. On this chart, I have uh, indicated nine points of comparison. There is no valid scientific basis for a specific number of points. However, in some countries, there are court uh, evidentiary rules that require a certain number of points. So you have to you have to testify in line with your department policies and procedures. When writing a report, uh, um, these are the items that should go into a formal report that you're referencing. Now, my reports for the police agencies were usually just one short paragraph with the rest of the information available in boxes. However, as a consultant, my reports may run 15 to 20 pages uh, where I'm providing a, a, a personal report as a private consultant. Uh, the elements of courtroom testimony for a fingerprint expert when you're testifying to an identification are, of course, different from the elements of testimony for the fingerprint technician. The expert testifying to the identification will testify, of course, to qualifications first, and then to the foundations of the science. That is the uniqueness of friction ridge skin, and that requires an understanding of the biology behind the uh, formation of the of the fingerprints on the baby as it develops in its mother's womb. And the second foundation on which fingerprint identification is based is the persistence or the permanence of friction ridge skin. Once it's formed on the baby, once the baby is born, the fingerprints are permanent. That is to say, the details that we look for when we're comparing fingerprints are persistent throughout life. Now, obviously, the finger is going to grow as the person grows. Fingerprints age. My fingerprints today, I'm 75 years old. My fingers' tips are mostly just smooth skin with a lot of wrinkles. Old people have, have very hard fingerprints to develop or to take fingerprints from because the ecrine glands in our fingerprint ridges die or cease to function as we age and our skin gets smoother and softer and more wrinkled. So it's not entirely Highly correct to say the fingerprints are permanent. They do change with aging, but the details that we look at when we're making identifications are permanent throughout life, even though the appearance may change. Once we learn what we're looking for in the details, those do remain permanent unless the skin is damaged by burning or scarring. The third area I would testify to is the origin and chain of custody of the evidence, how I received the fingerprints. Then I would testify to the examination of the evidence in this case, the case at trial today. This is where I would use a charted enlargement if I had one. And then the final element of my testimony is my conclusion, that the fingerprints were made by the same person, that they could not have been made by the same person, or that I am really not able to to tell the difference. Now, as I said, this is this is a basic introduction to fingerprint development, primarily using powder, ninhydrin, and super glue as the three um, the three development techniques that I would consider the backbone 
of fingerprint development. But as I said, if you're going to work in a laboratory, you're probably going to spend anywhere from two to five years learning all of the more sophisticated chemical development techniques, as well as fluorescence and photography, Adobe Photoshop imaging techniques uh, in order to, to enhance the fingerprint image and make it easier to work with. Um, so with that, <clears throat> I want to go in to questions and I want to start out with a few questions and then I will take questions from the attendees today. But in the, uh, in the introductory uh, information that the attendees provided to the host uh, the last week or two, there were several topics that came up that were, that were of interest. A question was asked about the hereditary nature of fingerprints. And there is some heredity involved in fingerprints, but that's only at the level of patterns. The patterns on the fingerprint, that is to say the, the size of the fingerprint, the ridge counts, the whirls, the loops, the arches, patterns tend to be hereditary. And the pattern is dependent upon the size of the volar pads on the baby at about a week 10 or 11 during development of the tiny baby in its mother's womb. Volar pads are the meaty pads on the tips of the fingers and in the palms. And you can't see these on your hand because they have regressed during the growth. But on that tiny, tiny baby, as it's developing in the wound, these pads are very prominent on the fingertips and in the palms. And it is the size and shape of those volar pads on that tiny baby that determine the patterns that are going to develop on the baby. However, the individual bifurcations and ridge endings, the enclosures, the short ridges, the dots that we use for identification, those are random and are subject to differential growth on the fingerprint as the skin is growing and enlarging between about week 11 and week 16 of the development of the baby. So while the patterns of the fingerprints are hereditary, the points that we use for comparison are not. You might expect then, if patterns are hereditary, that there would be a closer similarity of fingerprints between siblings. And that's true. Brothers, uh, for example, will have closer fingerprint patterns than strangers in the general population. And the most similar fingerprints, of course, on patterns will be identical twins. But even in identical twins, the individual bifurcations and ridge endings uh, will still be different. So identical twins, although they may have very, very similar patterns, will still have different fingerprints. Another question asked during the, uh, the, the pre-course uh, information was about touch DNA and latent prints. DNA detection has become so sophisticated. Uh, when, when it was first brought about in the early 90s, it took at least a whole drop of blood at a crime scene before you could develop a, thing, uh, a DNA profile. And now you can develop DNA out of many of the fingerprints at a crime scene. Uh, it's possible even to develop DNA sometimes by peeling the tape off of a lift card and searching, the, searching for DNA in that fingerprint. I am not a DNA expert. I have been told by DNA experts that sometimes the development of, of touch DNA is of value for familial association more than it is for, for positive identification. So touch DNA sometimes can lead to a genetic search, and it can be determined that a family is more likely to produce this DNA than a stranger in the population without being able to specifically pinpoint a member of the family. And we've all read cases, I presume, of, of, case, of situations where DNA was traced back through genetics, through some of the um, ancestral websites to track down a potential suspect. Uh, the software I use, and another question that came up uh, during those uh, uh, forms prior to the course were the software I use. I use Adobe Photoshop. 
um, that's because I was trained on Adobe Photoshop. There are special software programs now um, for working specifically with fingerprints. And some of those are based on Adobe Photoshop. Some of them are completely independent of, of, of Adobe Photoshop. I use Photoshop because that's what I was trained on. I'm reasonably proficient in it. And uh, maybe it's the old dog new trick theory. Uh, I've used it for so long. I'm not particularly interested in trying to learn a new um, photo imaging technique. Photoshop works very well for me. Um, I don't have to think about what I'm doing because um, it's become automatic with the fingerprints that I'm working with. A question was asked, can interdigital areas of the palm mimic fingerprints? And the answer is yes, they can. There are recurves in the interdigital and there are deltas in the interdigital that can look like fingerprints. But here's the difference. Part of the analysis of a finger or of, of an unknown mark, when we've developed a lift or, or taken a photograph of a print, part of the analysis is to determine the area of friction skin that the print came from. Did it come from a fingertip? Did it come from a palm? And what we consider there is normal handling. And normally, if you're handling an item, you can envision how it was touched. And that, as part of the analysis of the fingerprint or of the finger mark, considerations of normal handling will advise you on where to start your comparison. Now, in some of my comparison exercises, when I was teaching week-long comparison classes to fingerprint examiners, I would have something like a, a Cohen where somebody had touched the coin with the interdigital layer of the palm. And it would look like a fingerprint on that coin when, in fact, it was part of the interdigital area. But if you're developing that on something, for example, a water bottle or a countertop or a door or a window pane, then considering normal handling will help uh, give you direction in where you're going to look for in the fingerprint. The question was asked, can we determine gender from the fingerprint? And that's getting outside my area of expertise. I would presume that from the DNA, we could determine gender, but that's just a guess on my part. Um, I was asked about the accuracy and reliability of fingerprints. What I would say in that regard is that over a century of use of fingerprints as a means for identification, fingerprint identification has been proven very reliable and very accurate. Um, one of our chief critics in, in fingerprint science is Simon Cole. Dr. Cole um, even will admit that fingerprints are probably accurate and reliable. But he raises the objection that we don't know how accurate and reliable. Uh, the FBI said that in 1999, the FBI testified in the uh, Byron Mitchell hearing in federal court in Philadelphia that the error rate for fingerprint identifications is approximately 1 in 11 million. Now, I think that's outlandish. Uh, I think that there are far more errors made than that. Uh, my son, Casey Wertheim, along with Glenn Langenberg, did a research project in their classes they were teaching where they were actually pushing the students beyond their comfort level. And they came up with an error rate of about one erroneous identification for every three and a half thousand correct identifications. I think that if you were to look at error rate overall, I think it's somewhere between those two, somewhere between one error for three and a half thousand and one error for 11 million. Where it lies in the middle, who knows? But here's the problem with trying to talk about an error rate in fingerprints. Two problems, actually. The first problem is that some people make 
more errors than other people. So an overall error rate for the science of fingerprints could not be applied to one specific person. Uh, I've had students in class who make error after error after error. I've known other people who've never made an error in their career. And so you, if you tried to apply an overall error rate to those two different people, that overall error rate would be drastically off. It would be wrong for both of those individuals. But here's the second problem with trying to determine an error rate. If you're talking about a terribly bad smudged fingerprint that is borderline quality, then the chance of error is much greater. But if you have a very clear finger mark with 25 clear points of identification, then the error rate on that finger mark is going to be uh, infinitesimal, virtually zero. And so if you take an overall error rate uh, as determined by some of the black box studies or the white box studies, if you take that overall error rate and try to apply that error rate to a specific fingerprint comparison by a specific individual, that error rate is, is not going to be an appropriate measure of the accuracy and reliability of the fingerprint evidence in that specific case. So I, I would suggest to you that the accuracy and reliability of fingerprint identification is high. But I would agree with, with our critic, Dr. Simon Cole. We don't know exactly how high the error rate is. I think in each case in court, a defense attorney is best advised in having his own expert review the evidence and go over it with the attorney before going to trial. Now, with that, I'd like to throw this open to uh, questions. And if you have any questions, let's see if I can get back to uh, to the chat box here where we can, uh, well, that didn't do it. I can't see the chat box here to read if we have any questions. Munta, can you hear me? Um, yes, please. Sam, are you there? Sam, well. Yes. Can you, uh, are any of our attendees submitting questions? Hello? Okay, I think my co-host is... Hello, so yeah. I'll take over from there. Okay, then. Please attend to the questions. Oh, okay. Ah, here we go. Yes. Huh? Okay. I, I, I've got it now. I've got the chat box up here so I can see. Um, uh, for the, the number of points to be considered. Uh, this, is, this is a point that many defense attorneys will bring up. How many points did you have? And the problem is that we don't just use points. And this is why I draw that chart in court that, uh, that I showed, showed. Oh, let me see. Hold on just a second. Here I am. Okay, can you see me now, Munta? Yeah. Are you there, Munta? Yeah, yeah, I'm here with you. I can see you. Okay, good, good. Um, when I'm testifying in court and I draw that chart that shows pattern, points, and shapes, what I tell the jury is that it is not scientifically valid to only use points, that the best scientific comparison uses all three levels, uses the pattern, the points, and the shapes. So, for example, if I have a whole lot of that, what we call level three detail, then I might be willing to make an identification on fewer points. But if I don't have any of that level three detail and the print is badly smudged, then I might not be comfortable making an identification unless I have many more points. The question might come up, what is the fewest number of points ever used to make an identification? 
And the answer is going to surprise you. But it was published in the Journal of Forensic Identification, I believe, in 2001. And a print was identified with zero points because it had so many of the level three details, the little bumps on the ridges, the sweat pores, incipient ridges that you couldn't count as points. And yet it, it was presented to the scientific working group on friction, ed, friction ridge analysis, uh, study and technology, SWIGFAST. And over 30 of the fingerprint examiners, fingerprint experts present at SWIGFAST agreed that it was a correct identification. And so the, the total number of points scientifically, there is no valid basis for determining a minimum number of points. Now, having said that, I will add that if your agency requires a minimum number of points, you have to abide by your agency policy. Likewise, if the court requires a minimum number of points or if your country or state requires a minimum number of points, then you have to abide by that. Let me let me take that a little further, though, and say that, for example, at Fort Worth Police Department, the last uh, crime laboratory where I worked, our policy required eight points for a normal identification. There were three fingerprint examiners there. So if I made an identification with eight or more points, then it had to be verified by one of the other examiners. But if I made an identification with fewer than eight points, there were three of us. And then we all three had to agree on the identification before I could report it. So while we had an eight point minimum in the policies and procedures, it was not really a minimum. It was a, a threshold where if we fell below eight points, it required a more stringent verification before we could report the results. Uh, so um, that's that would be my answer to how many points are required. It depends on the three levels of detail in the latent print, and it depends on your court um, rules of evidence, and it depends on your department policy where you're working. Which latent print methods recommend in terms of destructive analysis? If you want to preserve the fingerprint on the surface, uh, super glue first. Super glue for, for non porous surfaces. Now, super glue on porous surfaces is not a good method, but on porous surfaces, you would use uh, a ninhydrin or uh, some of the fluorescent chemicals which work similar to ninhydrin, uh, DFO indane dione or some chemicals that can be used on paper which uh, some people believe are more sensitive than ninhydrin and they produce fluorescent prints so if you're using those chemicals then you have to use either laser or forensic light source and photograph the print as it is glowing under that light source um can automotive, automation and artificial intelligence contribute to streamlining? I think the answer to that is going to be yes. But herein lies the, the bottom line, and that is that your artificial intelligence or, or your, your uh, software cannot testify in court and be cross-examined. Also, all those can do is rank the pattern on a candidate list, who is most likely. It still takes the expert to form the conclusion that they were, in fact, made by the same person. Now, the software has improved. The first APHIS systems we had uh, on, a, on a complex case, oh, back in the early 90s, I might have looked at 100 candidates on the candidate list. It was, it was not uncommon to make your fingerprint identification down into between the 10th candidate and the 20th candidate on the candidate list. The improved algorithms in the APHIS systems now 
the last AFA system I worked with, if you had an identification, he was probably the number one candidate. You very seldom went down past the single digits on the candidate list. It was almost always number one. Some of the other software programs uh, are being designed to to calculate a likelihood ratio or a probability. For example, the software program developed by Henry Swafford at the U.S. Army Crime Lab is called FR Stats, capital F, capital R, capital S, little T-A-T-S, uh, which stands for fring- finger friction ridge statistics. FR Stats uh, has been used by the Army Crime Lab for, oh, perhaps six or eight years as a likelihood ratio that a friction uh, that a, that a mark was made by the person but they only use that likelihood ratio after they have made an identification using traditional methods of fingerprint comparison identification another fingerprint software program is the uh, pianos 4 it's capital p little i capital a little n little o capital s and then the number four pianos four is the software program developed at the university of Lausanne by christophe shampoo and his team Uh, i'm currently entering fingerprints into pianos four for part of a research project i'm engaged in uh, with dr david stoney and with christophe and with some other people and we're looking at fingerprints with three or more points. And can we determine any information that would be of value to the court? We're looking specifically at, at uh, 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 firearms cartridge casings, where we know, know that it is, is very rare that you can actually develop a full fingerprint to make a positive identification on a cartridge casing. But if we have a tiny print with four or five points, can we give some kind of probability or likelihood ratio? It's a research project. So we're not at the point of saying that yet. It's still just a research project. Uh, I don't know how artificial intelligence is going to contribute to that. That's a, excuse me, just a second. (coughs) That's another question entirely. And uh, though there's a, a, a good future uh, to be seen with artificial intelligence in this business. Um, if a fingerprint, aha, I love this question. Um, if a fingerprint is not suitable but has small detail, um, can we use that? Um, Edmund Locard in 1950. 1950- 15 testified in court to a palm print that he identified on the basis of sweat pores alone. Now, in fairness, that print had probably a thousand points in it. But just to, to prove, pardon the pun here, to prove his point, Locard compared the sweat pores in that print to make the identification. As I mentioned, that one print in uh, 2001 that was published in the Journal of Forensic Identification, a zero-point identification based only on the level three detail. Is there a rule, and I'm I'm reading down the question here, um, how do we count pores? Is there any rule for that? No. And frankly, in the U.S., we have what we call a Daubert hearing, which is to test the scientific validity of the evidence being presented. And it's a separate evidentiary hearing, not part of the trial. And I would have to believe that a Daubert challenge to level three detail might very well succeed in preventing an identification based on level three detail alone from being introduced in court. I don't know that we've ever had a Daubert hearing on level three detail alone. Um, Ash. Oh, what are we doing here, Monta? Okay. Um, Ashbaugh in his uh, paper, Ridgeology, does show one fingerprint um, that is a level three identification on an electrical card that's that's very interesting. Let's see. Ongoing research or future development, do you foresee in the field? Oh, that is wide open. There, um, when I got into this business, there was no research money. Um, 
we had done things the same way for a hundred years and we didn't see any reason to change it. What has happened with Daubert and with some of the other critics, for example, um, I mentioned Dr. Simon Cole. I consider Simon a close personal friend, even though he's one of the strongest critics of fingerprint identification. Simon has published books and numerous articles. Uh, the, his book was titled Suspect Identities, and he's published numerous articles attacking fingerprint evidence. And as a critic of fingerprints, Simon Cole has actually created an environment where there is grant funding for research. And so there's a lot of research going on. I mentioned the, the research project I'm, I'm working on now with Dr. Stoney and Dr. Shampo, looking at partial fingerprints, tiny fragments on shell casings to determine, can we say anything? We don't know. That's the research project. Um, ongoing research and so much research being done in chemicals, and other development techniques and preservation techniques. Yes, uh, uh, Munta has put a note up there. Please follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is on LinkedIn, Pat Wertheim. I publish a little article and post it late every Sunday evening here in Texas so that it should be available around the world on Monday morning when you show up to work and pour your first cup of tea or your first cup of coffee. Uh, a little short article on some anecdote from my career, some of them from when I was a police officer, some of them from when I was a crime scene technician, some of them are funny stories, some of them are just tragic, uh, some of them are philosophy or history that I'm discussing, but something every Monday morning, and please check on LinkedIn, look me up, click to connect or follow, and check in on Monday morning to see what I've put up for that week. Is there any software that can totally compare fingerprints after the data is inserted? Um, not, not validated at this point. There are software programs. For example, I mentioned uh, FR Stats and Pianos, Pianos 4. And there are others out there on the market. But none of them have been validated. And none of them can make a positive identification. The positive identification still has to be made by the expert, and then the software can be used to support that identification, but the software cannot make the identification on its own. Um, this, uh, oh, my email, I'll put that slide back up here. The email address, uh, let me just say the email address. It's for idents, F-O-R-I-D-E-N-T-S, for idents at gmail.com. And uh, we'll get that. Uh, and then on on LinkedIn, it's just if you search for Pat Wertheim, uh, let me see if I can put that last slide back up again. If if I can figure out how to do this, <laughs> I uh, okay. Let's try this entire screen questions share. Okay, here we go, and I'm. Is that? Is that not coming up? Okay. Now we've got that. And let's come over. Okay. Here's my mailing address. If if you if you want to to correspond by mail. I'm at post office box 150492, Arlington, Texas, and the postal code is 76015. My email address is faridents, F-O-R-I-D-E-N-T-S, at gmail.com. On LinkedIn, search for Pat Wertheim, W-E-R-T-H-E-I-M, and I'd be thrilled to communicate with you by email or by messaging over LinkedIn. Uh, 
And uh, let's see, with that, I think we're out of time. So uh, I will turn this back over to you, Munta. Um, okay, just um, two questions, say then we close. Okay, so I just wanted to know, but um, I know over your careers, you will be have to deal with these kind of critics of forensic science, especially in terms of pattern related evidence. So mostly what I realized is that they don't criticize this science, but they kind of try to make um, their case based on the individual, like they base their case or their I'm, I'm having a very me. hard time understanding, Moon, it's coming, it's very faint. Um, Hello? Hello? Yes, I, I can hear you, but it's very faint. Let me see if I can do something to turn this speaker up. Okay, there we go. Okay. Try it now. Try yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at the challenges dealing with pattern evidence, like these critics of forensic science, especially with pattern evidence. Um, for example, these kind of um, friations like tool marks, ballistic uh, bullet comparison, uh, fingerprint, um, fingerprint comparison. They kind of, uh, most of the base argument is on the, what the expert they kind of try to say that there is no kind of standard validation. You give two fingerprints to different experts with different training, and most likely they will bring out a different outcome. So in that situation, like, how have you been dealing with the critics of forensic science who normally want to not attack the science? They believe or they agree that fingerprint is unique and it's reliable, but the challenge normally comes with the examiner. Right, and we're we're getting yeah, and you 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 bring up a good point there, Monta. Um, all areas of forensic science are under attack right now, and the effectiveness of a witness in court is dependent upon the witness's ability to communicate with a jury. I teach a separate class in in. Uh, <coughs> public speaking and courtroom presentation. And in fact, I'll be doing a webinar on that topic. Yes. yes. Are you there? Hello? Okay. I'll be doing a, a webinar on uh, public speaking and courtroom testimony, how to be an effective witness um, in the next couple of weeks for tri-tech training. Um, Tritech Forensics is the official training contractor for the International Association for Identification. And I would uh, invite anybody to go to the tritechtraining.com website and check on that webinar if you're interested in that. But you're right. All areas of forensic science are under attack right now. And it's the effectiveness of the individual witness in court that is important in conveying your information to the court. Okay, um, and, and with the paradigm shift you were also talking, one paper that I came across by Dr. Stewart Morrison, I'm not sure if you know him, I think he's Canadian, but, but based in the UK, you was also talking um, about dropping the likelihood ratio where you can rely solely or fully on machine learning to give us, let's say, um, fingerprint um, opinions or testimonies. Like, Could you say something about that? Yeah, that's one of those areas of research where uh, they may come up, researchers may come up with a, a viable and a validated software program that can take the, the human aspect completely out of the comparison. You might say that that's the situation with DNA, because in DNA, you have a, a, an objective profile, but that's true only in a sole source DNA uh, uh, profile. Because if you have a DNA mixture with strong profile and weak weak mixtures mixed together, then there's still a, 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 a good amount of subjectivity on the part of the individual in, in uh, 
reaching a conclusion. And again, I'll add, I'm not a DNA expert. So I'm speaking strictly uh, out of my own understanding of the situation. So there's research going on, and you will read papers by researchers promoting their viewpoint. But until a method or a software or an artificial intelligence uh, software program is validated for use in forensic science, it's still only that. It's an area of research. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And I was also considering the aspect of like, we're not having like, um, a similar case for all fingerprints. For example, you may train the software on one aspect of or one type of latent prints. Then maybe in terms of comparison, you may not get similar thing then. Well, that's true. Well, that's true. Yeah. Wouldn't be able to function. So. I guess it might take quite a lot of time or maybe never <laughs> <laughs> to get um, a complete software to handle those aspects. Right. Well, and so go for your PhD and get into research and help us help us get to that next level. Get to that next level. Hopefully, I know there are a lot of fingerprint enthusiasts on this page or currently in this platform. I know one um, that is my co-host Samuel Monyo. He told me some time back that he would like to take his um, his specialization in fingerprints. I'm sure your lecture would have, let's say, um, kind of whet his appetite more for the area. I'm sure he has learned a lot. <laughs> Sam, do you have anything to say? Hello, Sam. He's in Hello. Indian and it's quite very Hello. late over there. Yeah, Sammy. Yeah. 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 I'm still here. Are you, are you following? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so you, you want to take a print exam now. <laughs> I hope you've taken a lot from this yeah, session. Yeah, yeah, I'll take another part. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, please, any questions from the audience? Any question or suggestion or clarification? Okay, so without any. Without well, and, our head of, and okay. I'm, I'm, I will be available as long as I'm alive to answer questions by uh, email or by messaging on LinkedIn. So uh, I would urge all of our attendees today to keep my email address and, and connect with me on LinkedIn. And let's meet there. Sure. And I have been following um, Pat for quite a while and I've been learning a lot from his comments. Anytime I see his comment, I try to just go read what he wrote because mostly <laughs> um, the things he says are kind of mind boggling. Yeah, he's kind of been straightforward. A, <laughs> a spade is a spade, well, not a big spoon. Well, I talk about my failures too. In fact, my post. Uh, that I will be putting up tomorrow night is about one of my most embarrassing moments as a police officer. So, uh, if you want to, if you want to read a, a funny story that I found extremely embarrassing at the time, <laughs> check Monday morning and see what I've put up there. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> okay. So, without much further ado, I'll just head on to the announcement session. Hopefully, coming next month, we'll be having a workshop into our programming so if any of our viewers or audience present if you want to learn programming our we'll be having a session in our programming hopefully next month then followed by the lecture and we've also been planning to put up a conference a global or international conference very soon plan is still in process and i hope or i pray we still have mr pat to join us to enlighten us more in this upcoming conference any audience that is present, you can check out our pages, our social media pages. We are available on LinkedIn as well, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, or X, and Instagram. So if you follow us on any of our pages, we'll be giving timely updates so that you can follow us or subscribe to us for any of our sessions. We'll, we'll always keep you posted. So without much further ado, I would like to thank Mr. Pat very much for this insightful lecture. I have learned a lot, even, um, let's say, being a student and also um, a professional.
forensic enthusiast for over six years. Still, I've still learned a lot from this session. A lot of information I wasn't privy to, but now, thanks to this lecture, I am now well informed. I hope to keep learning and I hope to keep uh, in touch so that every once in a while he can always keep me in check. Now, okay. to our wonderful audience, thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your patience and then we, we appreciate your participation. We hope to see you in our upcoming sessions. Thank you very much, all. We would like to close the session, if nothing else. Okay. And thank you, Munta. It's it's been an honor. It's, thank you. It's been an honor. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's our pleasure, Pat. Have a good day. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye -bye. So okay, we'll be meeting you.